From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. I'm Kaylee Lines. Kamala Harris zeroes in on the economy in a speech in Pittsburgh today, pledging to shore up union jobs and manufacturing. We will invest in the industries that, for example, made Pittsburgh the steel city by offering tax credits for expanding good union jobs in steel and iron and manufacturing communities. We'll have more on her plans and the contrasting proposals of Donald Trump with Kimberly Clausing, former Deputy Assistant Treasury Secretary and Harris Wall's campaign surrogate. Plus, we'll be joined this hour by Republican Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia as her chamber gets set to vote on the stopgap government funding measure that just passed the House, wrapping up congressional work until after the election. So thank you for joining us this evening and joining me for all of these conversations on Balance of Power. Today is Megan Scully, who leads Bloomberg's congressional coverage. Megan, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. We have no shortage of news to discuss today. Well, certainly that's true. Of course, we just got news out of the House. A continuing resolution, perhaps no surprise has indeed passed. It's on to the Senate now, but this government is not going to be shutting down at the end of the fiscal year. No, not until December 20th, at least. And they all get to go home now to campaign, which is exactly what they've been wanting to do. Yep, campaigning for those down-ballot races. And of course, the campaign continues in the presidential race as well, including today for Kamala Harris, an appearance at the Economic Club in Pittsburgh, where she outlined specifically what she'd like to do with American manufacturing. And across all these industries of the future, we will prioritize investments for strengthening factory towns. This is so important. For strengthening factory towns, retooling existing factories, hiring locally, and working with unions. Because no one who grows up in America's greatest industrial or agricultural centers should be abandoned. Joining us now for more, Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson and Bloomberg government's Jonathan Tamari here with us in our Washington, D.C. studios. Welcome to you both. Of course, it wasn't just the speech from Kamala Harris today, but we now have a policy book, 82 pages long. You can find it online. Read it if, in its entirety if you would like. A lot of it, though, Wendy outlines things she's already talked about, right. including when it comes to the child tax credit, for example. This new tax credit for manufacturing, though, also included, we just don't exactly no more specific details than that. No, we don't. And Kamala Harris right now, I mean, she joined the race with only a few months to campaign as opposed to a year and a half or sure. four years that, that candidates normally have. And she is, um, she doesn't want to lose a single solitary vote, right? She doesn't want to anger anyone. So she's keeping the policy book, her speeches at this very sort of general level where she's for workers and she's for employers and she's for capitalism and she's for, you know, uh, tax credits and for building the middle class. She's just going to be out there trying to make everyone happy and run the clock for 41 days, I think. <laughs> Now, Wendy, in terms of, you know, appealing to the masses, you know, she was in western Pennsylvania today, and I presume trying to paint herself as, as a pro-labor, um, right. and there has been concerns about that. Um, do you think she succeeded in that today? I think she did, yes. I mean, she says all the right things to unions, and there is this, you know, the Trump campaign is trying to make a big deal about how she didn't get the Teamsters endorsement, which they didn't get either, mm -hmm. but they are making a big deal about how a Democrat did not get the labor endorsement. She did get the endorsement of several locals or regional Teamsters unions and many other unions, but um, and she is promising to do all those things. She is also promising, as a centrist, to make it easier for companies and manufacturers to get the capital they need to keep going. So she's really, like I said, trying to 
you know, stick to that middle ground there. And of course, it's not a coincidence that she was giving this speech in Pittsburgh in the battleground state of Pennsylvania. Donald Trump, meantime, was in North Carolina and Georgia to give his own economic uh, policy speeches over the course of the last 24 hours or so. You obviously know Pennsylvania very well, Jonathan. Do these specific messages resonate better in that state than some of the other battlegrounds we're talking about, given its industrial history? Yeah, I think, you know, Pittsburgh is really emblematic of that kind of former manufacturing town. And, and a lot of the places, Pittsburgh itself has really been, uh, you know, revitalized by, by turning more towards the tech sector. But a lot of the areas around Pittsburgh had really suffered economically for a long time, lost a lot of the manufacturing. And that's where some of this message, her support of labor unions, probably plays really well. And I think it's similar in states like Michigan, Wisconsin, pretty similar demographically, pretty similar economically. Different, those states are different from some of the Sunbelt states, right, that are growing, that have had more newer industries and newer, um, newer economic uh, engines, uh, whereas those northern battlegrounds have kind of lost the, some of their population and lost some of their manufacturing over time. So those three, I think, all kind of move together economically and politically. Pivoting to another election issue closer to D.C., um, the House has just passed uh, the continuing resolution that would fund the government until December. Um, and Speaker Johnson had said it would be political malpractice to shut down the government now. Who would have gotten the blame if the government had shut down? <laughs> Pretty clearly Republicans, and I think even Speaker Johnson knew that, which is why ultimately he didn't really push this fight very far. He proposed one bill. It didn't work. And then he moved to the fallback that pretty much everybody agreed on. Um, House Democrats or Senate Democrats and Senate Republicans and Senate House Democrats were all on the same page. So House Republicans were kind of on an island. And even they weren't really united around this idea that Johnson put forward. There's a lot of Republicans in his own conference that just wanted to do what they ultimately did today. So not really sure what the last two and a half weeks accomplished, um, <laughs> uh, which is why I think we voted. they voted early and they're all getting out of here this afternoon. Doing the song and dance, I guess, just for the sake of, of doing it. And of course, we won't see them again until the lame duck session. And that's something that Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffrey talked about before this resolution passed today. The three unresolved issues that need to be addressed are first, funding the government, avoiding a shutdown. Second, making sure we, of course, pass the National Defense Authorization Act to ensure our military readiness in an increasingly dangerous world. Third, it will be important to see if we can find a path forward and reauthorize the farm bill. But of course, when they attempt to do this work on, upon their return to Washington, Wendy, Hawking Jeffries might know if he's speaking as the presumptive future House Speaker in the next Congress, and Mike Johnson might be in an entirely different position as well, and that's likely to affect how lawmaking actually happens in those weeks, right? Absolutely, and we were talking about this before the show. It's a sort of bizarre scenario. Also, Will we know by the time they come back who the president, the next president is? If there's a very likely chance, if this is very, very close, that it's going to drag out for a while. If Donald Trump does appear to lose, we are sure he's going to challenge it at least. Um, even Democrats are gathering lawyers for a fight. So it's there's that chaos. And then, as you said, are Republicans in charge of the House or Democrats? Who's running the Senate? <laughs> and it will be the old Congress that will negotiate this. But they have to look ahead only a few weeks to when the new Congress comes in and can deal with deal with undoing it, I guess, if they want to. All right. Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson and Jonathan Tamari of Bloomberg Government, thank you both for joining us this evening. Now, coming up, we'll take a deeper dive on Vice President Harris's economic speech this afternoon in Pittsburgh with former Treasury official and surrogate for the Harris Walls campaign, Kimberly Clausing. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Within the last hour, Vice President Kamala Harris released a long-awaited policy book in a bid to put a finer point on her proposals. It comes as both candidates focus in on the economy this week. And Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall is here to give us the specifics. Tyler. 
Yeah, hey, Kaylee, both candidates tried to hone in on U.S. manufacturing today during dueling economic speeches. Harris floated new tax credits to expand union manufacturing jobs and emphasized what she's calling industries of the future. Generation of breakthroughs from advanced batteries to geothermal to advanced nuclear are not just invented, but built here in America by American workers. This comes after former President Trump sharpened his own pledge this week to boost domestic manufacturing, which has been in decline. He's proposing a mix of tax incentives and tariffs to do so. I'm imposing tariffs on your competition from foreign countries, all these foreign companies countries that have ripped us off. Your companies are going to come in. They're going to pay a low tax rate and a really low tax rate if they make their product in America, which is what we want to do because we're creating jobs like no other country would be able. Trump has floated cutting the corporate tax rate to as low as 15 percent for companies who make their products in the U.S., while Harris has proposed raising that rate to 28 percent. A Goldman Sachs analysis out this month estimates Trump's plan would likely boost S&P 500 earnings by 4 percent, while Harris's would reduce them by 5 percent. Trump's also focused in on tariffs, including a potential 10 to 20 percent tariff across the board and a 60 percent tariff on imported Chinese goods. Bloomberg economists estimate the plan could raise consumer prices about two and a half percent. But Trump disputes it would be inflationary. It comes as the Federal Reserve eases monetary policy as it tracks closer to its two percent inflation goal. New data out this morning show a- shows applications for refinancing mortgages surged for a second week in a row as Americans start to see the cheapest borrowing costs in nearly two years. Kaylee, housing is shaping up to be a big issue on the campaign trail. Just today alone, Harris highlighted her plan to help first-time home buyers with down payment assistance, while Trump called for less regulation in the industry. All right, Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall. Great reporting. Thank you so much. Now joining us for more on Harris's economic proposals is Kimberly Clossing, former Deputy Assistant Treasury Secretary and Professor of Tax Law and Policy at UCLA. She is also a surrogate for the Harris Walls campaign. Kimberly, welcome to Balance of Power. Great to have you here on Bloomberg. Obviously, one of the newer ideas we heard from Harris today does relate to this notion of tax credits uh, for American manufacturing. She's calling it the America Forward Tax Credit. What is the difference between a tax credit like that and, say, just a lower corporate tax rate for companies that make products in America, like Donald Trump is proposing a 15 percent net net? Doesn't this mean companies have to give less money to the government? I think he might be muted, Kimberly. Sorry about that. Corporate tax falls disproportionately on shareholders and really benefits the most well-off Americans in an, in an indiscriminate way. And we saw with Trump's first ta- corporate tax cuts in the the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was passed in 2017, the corporate tax revenues went down a lot, but it didn't really move growth in a discernible fashion. It certainly didn't help wages or job creation in those kinds of sectors. And interestingly, in that tax bill, there's actually a big incentive to do things offshore rather than in the United States. The tax rate on offshore income in that very bill is half the rate that it is in the United States. If you compare that to the Harris plan, the Harris plan is much more targeted. She's focusing on ways to encourage particular industries rather than sort of this carte blanche, every corporate taxpayer gets a tax cut. And if you look at the Biden administration, their focus was really on clean energy industries and chips and building infrastructure. And Biden-Harris administration did a good job launching that a lot of manufacturing investment in those sectors through through those tax incentives. Kimberly, um, question for you. You know, you obviously tax is, is a huge priority in this election campaign, largely because the 2017 uh, tax cuts expire next year and uh, will be a, a source of debate in Washington, perhaps the biggest debate in Washington next year. You've called those uh, Trump's tax cuts regressive, um, and, and um, but there's going to be a, a huge battle going forward. What areas do you see, no matter what happens in November, you know, we're, we're likely looking at a divided government. What areas do you see for agreement between these two proposals? 
I think one area that they're going to have to agree on is the need to pay for some of these tax cuts. Uh, one thing mm -hmm. that we've seen with the Trump campaign proposals is they suggested completely extending every single one of these Tax Cuts and Jobs Act provisions, which is a cost of about $5 trillion. But they've also suggested no taxes on tips, no taxes on overtime, no taxes on Social Security, um, and a 15 percent corporate rate. And when you add that up, that's about $9 trillion worth of additional deficits over 10 years. If you contrast that with the Harris approach, which is to, to pay for a lot of the additional um, tax cuts that might be extended under a negotiation in 2025, I think that's a more fiscally responsible approach when you're starting with deficits that are at 6% of GDP and higher. Um, so I think they're going to have to come together and pay for some of this, or they're going to find that interest rates go up rather than down, and that's going to harm typical middle class um, families who are, who are trying to pay for things like mortgages mm -hmm. and their other debts. Well, one of the ways Donald Trump says those will be paid for is because more revenue is going to come into the Treasury's bank account from tariffs, potentially hundreds of billions of dollars, he says. Uh, obviously, he, he, the Biden administration has kept intact the majority of the tariffs put into place during the first Trump administration. In fact, in some areas, they've implemented even greater ones. So how does Kamala Harris draw a contrast with herself on tariff and trade policy specifically when they have not shied away from some of those uh, tools that Donald Trump employed the first time around? Yeah, I think this is an area of a lot of confusion. So let's try to unpack the differences between the two proposals in this space. When when Trump's first presidency and hope perhaps only presidency was in place, he put tariffs on about $300 billion worth of Chinese products. And that tax base um, did see tariff increases in the neighborhood of 20 percent, and those have been continued under Biden. And those cost U.S. households several hundred dollars in terms of increased costs, uh, but they were narrowly focused on areas of concern with respect to China. Now, contrast that to the new Biden tariffs, which fall on $18 billion of trade. That's a very small amount versus the new Trump tariffs, where he's suggesting new tariffs on $3.1 trillion worth of goods imports. That's a base that's about 10 times the size of the round one Trump tariffs, and it would affect every single good in the world, regardless of whether we're importing from Canada or the UK or Japan. Every single product would have higher tariffs of 10 to 20 percent. When you look at the tax increase implied by that really broad tariff increase, which, by the way, is 200 times the size of the additional Biden tariffs, um, that could amount to as much as two to $4,000 per, per American household when you look at the numbers. And it, it depends some on the assumptions exactly where you end up and which policies he, he really settles on there. But that's a big tax increase. And it's a big shifting of the tax burden down towards those who are going to the store every day and spending all their money and away from those who might have otherwise paid higher corporate taxes or higher personal income taxes. So it's a it's a switch of, of tax burden lower in the income distribution. Right. How do you thread that needle then, um, you know, particularly in in the in the, the Rust Belt swing states between, um, you know, protecting manufacturing while also, you know, not having tariffs that are so onerous on American consumers? Yeah, I think that's a really essential question here. And one thing to focus on is what did we learn from the past tariffs? And we often saw that in the very same communities that were supposed to be helped from those tariffs, that they on net lost jobs in part because of the retaliation that trading partners put on our goods when we put tariffs on their goods hurts U.S. export industries and it hurts our productivity kind of across the board. In contrast, if you subsidize key industries that you have concerns about, let's say you really want clean energy to succeed, so you subsidize uh, clean steel production, right? That is a way that you're actually lowering the price of steel for consumers by helping make clean steel production in the United States and adding their incentives to, to increase production without raising costs uh, through the tariff mechanism, which is, I think, a much more distortionary and regressive way to achieve or to try to achieve some of the same aims. All right. Kimberly Clossing, professor of tax law and policy at UCLA and surrogate for the Harris-Walls campaign. Thank you for joining us.
Coming up, the U.N. Security Council set to meet tonight on escalating tension in the Middle East as Israel prepares for a possible ground operation against Hezbollah in Lebanon. We'll discuss that next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Eighty thousand people have been evacuated from the uh, border communities in Israel. Uh, probably an equal number of, of Lebanese civilians have been evacuated. Civilians who are not a part of Hezbollah but are suffering the consequences of Hezbollah's actions. So what Israel is doing is taking action against Hezbollah to try to secure its uh, communities on on the border with Lebanon. Uh, but this is also necessary to, to give security to the people in Lebanon, who uh, unfortunately are, are under the, the thumb of Hezbollah. Democratic Congressman Brad Schneider of Illinois on the early edition of Balance of Power, as the Israeli army chief says the military is preparing for a possible ground operation in Lebanon. We're joined now by Bloomberg senior foreign policy reporter Ian Marlowe in New York, where, of course, the United Nations General Assembly is still underway. The Security Council, in fact, at the U.N., Ian, is going to be talking about this this evening. What is the degree of concern among the countries that are gathered where you are? Yeah, it's an interesting backdrop. People here are racing to find some kind of off-ramp uh, solution for the escalating violence between Israel and uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, the U we've reported today that the U.S., France, the U.K., and other allies uh, in partnership with Israel are trying uh, desperately now to find, find some kind of immediate uh, off-ramp for the violence to stop the escal escalatory cycle and allow some space for a diplomatic solution, which obviously they've been trying to get now uh, for months and have been unable to because Hezbollah is, is linking their own actions, firing rockets into Israel with the ongoing war in Gaza and the lack of a ceasefire there. We're mostly talking now about um, a short-term, um, you know, agreement here. Can you walk us through what, what could happen over the next several days and weeks? Yeah, I think what people are most concerned about now is just the, the pace and ferocity of the Israeli bombardment of, of targets in Lebanon. Uh, the death toll has gone up uh, dramatically, around 600 in just a few days. Uh, and there is a, there's an urgent desire to, to just stop that sort of violence. Israel may not fully be on board mm -hmm. with that. They have their campaign going. But the, 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 the idea now is to get something uh, in place that can secure a, a, a sort of temporary ceasefire between Israel and uh, Hezbollah and then uh, allow the sort of space for the diplomatic negotiations to, to unfold. It's not clear whether that will okay. be successful, but it's what people are trying. All right, Bloomberg's Ian Marlowe in New York this evening. Thank you so much. And coming up next, we'll go to Capitol Hill, where Republican Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia will join us for a wide-ranging conversation as her chamber is voting now on a continuing resolution to keep the government funded. This is Bloomberg. Continuing resolutions are no way to fix a problem that avoids all the serious things you'd have to do to get the country back on track. The good news is we don't have to go through another crazy countdown clock. We should have never gotten here, but it will set up a, uh, a fulsome uh, lame duck session. Republican Senator Mike Braun of Indiana and Democratic Senator Mark Warner of Virginia weighing in on the short-term funding bill that just passed the House and the Senate is voting on it as we speak. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Kaylee Lines, joined this evening by Megan Scully, who leads Bloomberg's congressional coverage. So, Megan, obviously, the government is not going to shut down if the Senate, as we all assume it will, passes this uh, in just a few minutes here. But the process it took to get here, all something that came together quite quickly after the initial plan A of House Speaker Mike Johnson yes. failed. 
Yes. Well, jet fumes are a powerful motivator, <laughs> and these lawmakers want to get back to their states and to their districts so they can get on the campaign trail. There's also the hurricane that is yeah. brewing in the Gulf Coast, and a lot of these members, including the top two le House Republican leaders, um, who are from Very Louisiana. You know, a lot of these lawmakers, their states are going to be affected by this brewing storm. Yeah, so a lot of people trying to leave the Capitol as we speak, but one person still there live on Capitol Hill is Republican Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia, who has just raced to our camera after casting a vote uh, on this continuing resolution. Senator, thank you so much for being with us. Did you vote for the CR? I did vote. Yes, I did. I voted to move forward. I have never voted uh, to, that would cause us to go into a shutdown. I think it's a misery march. Uh, it's not the way we should be doing it. We did appropriations. I'm on appropriations committee. Senator Schumer refused to put those bills up, but at least we're continued until December. Uh, and that, I think, is a sigh of relief for a lot of people. Senator Warner talked about a fulsome debate when uh, when Congress returns after the election. Of course, we don't know, uh, you know, the outcome of the November election. But what do you expect to be sort of on the the agenda? What will you be pushing for to get to get funded um, in the in the slam duck? Well, I'm the ranking member of the uh, Health, Education and Labor Subcommittee, very large uh, funding uh, mechanism, funding funds all of our research, education and labor. Uh, I'm anxious to get our research, our health research, to find cures and to find treatments, to keep that in the, in the flow. So that's something I'm going to be looking at. But I really think what I'd love for, the, for, the, uh, for uh, Senator Schumer to do is to put these bills up individually so that we can amend them, so that we can have a full discussion on them and then vote. That's what we're supposed to do. We should, we could have been doing this all along and we didn't. And so we are going to have some time. The, bill, the bills passed almost unanimously out of our subcommittees as, um, or out of our committee uh, bipartisan. It's time for us to debate on the Senate floor, and I hope that's what we do. I'm also going to be looking for the defense authorization bill, which should be coming through. We've already um, we've already had a discussion on that, but we need to get to the uh, conference committee there so we can set the course of our military. And it sure would be great if we could get a farm bill. We've had a drought in West Virginia that's been very costly and damaging to our farmers. Well, certainly, and we hope you'll come back and join us in the lame duck session to see whether or not those priorities can actually get through before the new Congress uh, seat is seated in January. Senator, I'd like to ask you about something more immediate, though, as well, considering while there is a continuing resolution vote happening today on Capitol Hill, a lot of members will leave after that and senators will as well. But tomorrow, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will be on the Hill. I don't know, Senator, if you're planning to meet with him. I know others are. And this comes at a time when some of your Republican colleagues have been criticizing President Zelensky for visiting a plant helping make weapons for Ukraine in Pennsylvania during this trip to the United States. Does he deserve that criticism? Well, I think, you know what, Senator, uh, he, he, President Zelensky has been on Capitol Hill several times. I will not be there tomorrow, uh, but I must, and I, but I've been very much a supporter of Ukraine in the fight against Russia. I believe that pushing Russia back is the right thing and the timely thing, and in the end, the least expensive thing to do, unless they, because they'll be encroaching into other countries if they are successful in Ukraine. I do believe some of the rhetoric that uh, I saw President Zelensky uh, enter into yesterday uh, concerning uh, President Trump and Senator Vance as candidates was probably very misplaced. And uh, he, may, he may regret this when he hears tomorrow. I, I think he's better off mm -hmm. making a case for why his country is in desperate need of a United States coming forward with the help that we have. Switching for a minute to the presidential campaign, uh, we've heard yes. a lot in these last few days from both uh, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump in terms of their economic plan. Tariffs have been, you know, top of that list um, and, and certainly something we've been tracking here at Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. Have tariffs been good for West Virginia? You know, in certain industries, yes, our steel industry, our aluminum industry, uh, our hardwood industry, we've needed to have uh, a balancing of a uh, free and fair trade. And we've had uh, product dumped in the United States that's cost 
many, many, many jobs, but also cost our United States economy. Uh, we need to meet, make things here. And so for those products where we are heavily disadvantaged, such as the ones I mentioned, I do think tariffs are, are particularly effective. I don't think general tariffs over everything is an effective uh, way to go about uh, moving the economy forward. Uh, and, but, you know, I, I do think in certain targeted areas, tariffs can be very useful, but only in those instances. Well, Senator, if we couple those notions on tariff policy with some of the other proposals that Donald Trump has put forward on tax policy, many of the economists we speak with here on Bloomberg suggest what we're really talking about are policies that are going to fuel, fuel inflation and raise the deficit. Are you concerned about that when you look at the economy in West Virginia and compare it to, to the national economy, knowing the battle that has been fought over the course of the last several years against inflation, that that could be the end result? Well, look, we're living in inflation right now. You go to the grocery store, you're paying 30 percent more for bread, 33 percent more for uh, ground beef. Your rent has gone up. Your mortgage rates have gone up. Gasoline is up. Uh, power costs are up. We know what inflation looks like, and we know how painful it is for individuals in our state but across the country. So any inflationary action is, uh, is I think, extremely would be extremely damaging. But I will say this. Vice President Harris has said she's going to raise our taxes into the $6 trillion range. That, in my view, is very damaging to the economy. So I think that uh, under President Trump's former administration, we did tax relief, we grew jobs, we had some of the highest income uh, wage growth that we'd seen in years. So I look forward to those kinds of policies to, to lift all of us and lift everyone, and particularly in my state. Senator, you have been a champion for education and quality of life for girls in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, Afghanistan is very much in focus this week um, as the United, Center, United Nations General Assembly meets. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what measures do you think the president of the United States should take um, or Congress uh, to address the education of girls in Afghanistan? Is that something that could potentially come up as part of the annual defense bill, which you mentioned coming up in the, in the lame duck session? Well, you know, I think it's chilling what we see coming out of Afghanistan. In uh, 2021, Vice President Harris was self-proclaimed uh, by the New York Times to be the one who's going to be the protector of the rights of girls and women in Afghanistan. What do we see just this week? More enforcement, more uh, ratcheting down of um, uh, of uh, the ability for women to live free and clear. They can't go to school. They can't work. They can't look at men that are not their husbands. They have to be fully clothed. They, uh, I mean, fully covered. They have to have. Um, they're not allowed to laugh out loud or even talk loudly. So, and they're enforcing this. So, th this is a horrible re regime. A young uh, Afghani uh, girl says, "If we can't talk, why should we? Why can we live? How can we live?" And so, I think. The United States president working with Mrs. Bush, Laura Bush, was very active in rights for Afghan women and girls, engage the international community like she has, and put pressure on them to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, free women from this oppression that we see. Mm. Our abrupt withdrawal from Afghanistan is part of the reason that it's like this. They don't think we will engage, but we can engage in the international community on the horrors that we see there. All right, Senator, we appreciate your time this evening, especially running over right after your vote. Republican Senator sure. Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia, thank you so much. Always great to be on. Now thank coming you. up, it's always great to have you. We'll have more on the competing manufacturing proposals of Kamala Harris and Donald Trump as they take their economic cases to the swing states. Our political panel joins next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm a capitalist. I believe in free and fair markets. I believe in consistent and transparent rules of the road to create a stable business environment. And I know the power of American innovation. I've been working with entrepreneurs and business owners my whole career. And I believe companies need to play by the rules. 
Kamala Harris earlier this afternoon addressing her economic plans in Pittsburgh. Joining us now for more here on Bloomberg TV and radio is our political panel, Alvin Jordan, Democratic strategist, and Maura Gillespie, founder and principal of Blue Stack Strategies and Republican strategist. Welcome to you both. Alvin, I'll begin with you because Kamala Harris didn't just give a speech today. She released a whole policy book. It's 82 pages long, perhaps an answer to criticism that's been uh, lobbed her way by her opposition, that she's not getting specific enough in the details. But I wonder when your opponent is talking about a lower tax rate, mm -hmm lower regulatory barriers, potentially even federal zones to encourage manufacturing, is just saying we'll give you a tax credit if you manufacture in America really something that stands up to that? I mean, it depends on who's listening, right? And I think that really goes to who, you know, the uh, vice president is in fact speaking to at, at these rallies if you mm -hmm. want, really want to boil it down. And so I think for some that might be enough to at least um, kind of, you know, give a, a stronger talking point for some of the conversations that are being had. Uh, but I think to most, and I think the main point of, uh, you know, the vice president's appearance today was really just to start, uh, you know, appealing to the, you know, majority in the middle of the, the country. And I think she, you know, made that clear uh, today as she hadn't before. At what point, though, do we need to transition into more specifics? You know, there is an 82-page book. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be reading through it, I'm sure, in the coming days and weeks. But you know, in terms of her speeches on the campaign trail, they have been lacking in some of those specifics. Are we at the point now that we need to shift into uh, more detail? Well, I, you know, plans and versions of said plans have been released and available online, I think, as the campaign is ratcheted up, right? And I, just from a, a matter of diligence and, and uh, just, you know, doing research, I think that those <laughs> points are out there for people to go and take a look at now, and it's just a matter of how deep we plan on, on actually digging. As to say, there are, I can go look and read through you know, what the 80-something, 90-odd pages and kind of pull out specifics mm -hmm. if I was looking for them, but I don't know in a lot of the debates that are happening outside of the Beltway if that's exactly what people are, are trying to do, given that, uh, again, I think the specifics have... Um, been, you know, made available kind of throughout the process. Mm. Well, Maura, you may need to uh, wade through many pages of documents to get to the <laughs> specifics in the Harris plan. You also have to sit through, frankly, many minutes of a speech uh, from Donald Trump to get to the meat of his proposals, too. He talked in Savannah, Georgia, for example, yesterday for quite some time, and his ideas about specifically the economy and manufacturing were intermixed with uh, various other uh, thoughts that sometimes did feel uh, a bit uh, unrelated, shall we say. I know that you're a Republican. You may think his proposals are actually the winning uh, strategy to go with here in terms of what he'd like to do with taxes and tariffs, for example. But what about the delivery? Does Donald Trump need to put out a book or read a speech from the teleprompter like Kamala Harris did today? Talking about furniture at length, uh, I think maybe it was lost on some people as to why that was an important part of our economic plan for the future. Uh, so I do think that Republicans in Congress need to talk about what they want to be doing for the economy and why they should be you know, elected to the majority in the Senate, why Speaker Mike Johnson wants to grow his majority in the House. For Donald Trump out there, he's not really looking out for any of those people. He's looking out for number one, and that's a problem for the Republican tickets down ballot uh, because he has shown us that he's not capable of staying on message. The things he's touting is, you know, no taxes on tips. OK, great. Uh, you know, bringing back manufacturing to the United States, that is super important, uh, but it would be great to hear how he plans to do that. Uh, so I think that there would be, you know, again, if he had some members of Congress up there with him, or he was pointing to a bill that perhaps one of them introduced or was planning to introduce, I think coordinating the effort a little bit more uh, would be better for the Republicans. But again, I just don't see that being an option when he does like to have just the full attention and get to say whatever he wants to for two hours at a time in any given city he stops in. Uh, so I do think that that chaotic nature of Donald Trump, yes, it was effective in 2016. Uh, sure, he won, but it hasn't been effective since then. He continues to jeopardize Republicans' ability to win elections. As we speak right now, Mara, um, the you know, lawmakers are leaving Washington, flying home, and they are going to be out on the campaign trail with the economy being the number one 
topic. Uh, you mentioned, you know, wishing that, that Trump would, would point to specific legislation um, that Republicans have sponsored. What do you expect to be among the top campaign points? You know, they, they usually go home with talking points, you know, but what do you expect them, particularly for Republicans, making the case um, that, that they should keep majority of the House, that they should win the majority of the Senate? What points will they be making to constituents in the coming weeks? They have a lot to a lot to do in the lame duck session. Uh, they have a lot that they can talk about leading up to election day, and about you know polls show that Republicans are largely trusted on the economy and on safety and security. They can tout their efforts there. Uh, they can also talk about what they are going to get accomplished in the lame duck. You know, between the farm bill, they have different budget uh, appropriations packages they need to really firm up and finalize. So they can talk to them about those issues and, again, growing the majority of what they could do should they also get the Senate. Uh, the problem being, though, Congress didn't accomplish a whole mm -hmm. lot this year. So it's going to be tough to point to, here's legislation that we got through and it was done on this level. That one's going to be tough to do. I do think that my, yeah. uh, Speaker Mike Johnson is doing the best he can uh, and trying to balance out the Trump wing uh, with also the the realization that he is the speaker of the entire house, the whole house, and has to protect the integrity of the institution. All right, hold that thought. Maura and Alvin will be back with us. We're going to talk more about Congress with the Senate voting right now on the continuing resolution that already passed the House earlier today. We'll have more next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I did vote. Yes, I did. I voted to move forward. I have never voted uh, to, that would cause us to go into a shutdown. I think it's a misery march. Uh, it's not the way we should be doing it. We did appropriations. I'm on appropriations committee. Senator Schumer refused to put those bills up, but at least we're continued until December. Uh, and that, I think, is a sigh of relief for a lot of people. Republican Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia joining us just a few minutes ago, fresh from the Senate floor, where she did cast a vote for the continuing resolution to keep the government funded until December 20th. That vote is still ongoing. Back with us now for final thoughts, our political panel, Alvin Jordan and Maura Gillespie. Maura, of course, you were just talking about uh, this notion of Congress not having much to show for itself as it heads home for the final stretch uh, of the campaign season. For Mike Johnson in particular, having failed at plan A to get a six-month continuing resolution with the SAVE Act attached, having to go for plan B, despite what Donald Trump might have wanted him to do. When he returns to the House, potentially as someone who will be facing with being a leader in a minority come January, not the majority, depending on the outcome of the election, how do you think he's feeling about his job security right now? You know, right now I would say that it's probably in question. I don't think that if the Republicans, you know, if they lose the House, I don't see my, uh, Speaker Mike Johnson retaining his position in leadership. I just don't see that happening. I think that the louder voices are going to prevail. And at this point, you know, maybe they should. Maybe if, if they really think that Jim Jordan can do a better job, by all means. Uh, you know, I just think that, that that's, uh, it's not a realistic way because Jim Jordan doesn't have a good relationship across the aisle. And you need somebody who's at least willing to do the right things for the right reasons uh, to get things done. And I think what Speaker Johnson was doing was appeasing Trump and trying to avoid his continued urges for a government shutdown, which Trump was doing. Knowing that that's a problem, he tried to appease him. It did not work. And we all knew uh, this is going to end in a continued resolution as, as we're dealing with now. Uh, and I think that if the Republicans can win the House or keep the House, grow the majority by at least a few members, then maybe it's a different conversation. Uh, but I don't see him retaining his gavel uh, if they lose. <laughs> or his position in leadership, Alvin, I should say. Mm. Alvin, when we, we talk about Speaker Johnson, you know, you know whether he retains his, his position or not, and, and potentially Jim Jordan or Tom Emmer taking his place, be it in the majority or the minority next year, um, Johnson has, and, and he's been dinged for this, particularly by, by his right flank, negotiated with Democrats. Um, whether Democrats are in the majority or the minority in the House, you know, how, how would negotiations go with a, with a Jim Jordan or, or a Tom Emmer? Well, I think to Mara's point, uh, we can kind of take a peek and see that if those relationships uh, aren't so tight that we get, you know, a lot of what we've experienced now, maybe not to this extreme, 
But I, I think that, you know, just as we were talking uh, off off camera, you know, in a session that has been filled with, you know, a lot of nothing or a lot of <laughs> emptiness, um, I don't think more divisiveness uh, is the recipe for, you know, pulling together, um, you know, more green lights, as it were. And so uh, in that way, you know, you kind of look at, you know, maybe some fresh voices um, that, you know, uh, could maybe help move the needle a bit more. All right, Alvin Jordan and Maura Gillespie, our political panel this evening. Thank you both so much for joining us. And thanks to Megan Scully for joining me for this hour as yes. well. Our congressional uh, coverage leader, of course, here at Bloomberg. And a perfect day to have you <laughs> as the Senate now is getting ready to wrap up this vote on the continuing resolution and get out of Dodge. Yes, we're not going to see them for a very long time. But we will be watching closely on the campaign trail in the coming weeks because there's a lot of interesting races to be tracking. Yep, in both the Senate and the House, of course, as both chambers are being attempted to be flipped by uh, the other party. And of course, we'll continue our coverage of that for you, as always, and including in the Washington edition newsletter. You can find that on the terminal and online. And of course, we'll be back with more tomorrow on Bloomberg as President Biden and Vice President Harris, as well as leaders on Capitol Hill, are planning to meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. So join us tomorrow for more coverage of that here on Bloomberg TV and radio.